Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Off Farm Income Podcast. Thank you very much for joining us here on our YouTube channel. Well, hey, today we've got a really special interview. I know so many of the, the students I interview on the show and so many of you that listen are inter- are interested in going to veterinary school or you have somebody in your life who would like to go on and become either a large or a small animal veterinarian. That's a challenging thing to do. It's a challenging thing to get accepted to vet school, and then it's a very challenging thing to pay for vet school. Well, if you or the person in your life who wants to go down this path has an interest in both serving in the U.S. military and going to veterinary school, we've got, well, as our guest today will say it, we've got a very, very well-kept secret to tell you about to get that done. I'm going to be interviewing Sergeant First Class William Reese of the U.S. Army today, talking about the two different pathways to become a U.S. Army veterinarian and to have a large portion, or maybe all, of veterinary school paid for. We're going to jump into that for you right now. Well, Sergeant Reese, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Hey, sir, I appreciate you having me. Uh, Like I said earlier, anytime I get an opportunity to talk with a large group of individuals about some of the best kept secrets in the U.S. Army. I'm all about it and all in. So thank you very much for the opportunity to do so. Well, I appreciate it. And I know, uh, you know, it's funny talking to you off the air. It takes me back to my days as a police officer. As you're, you're, you're telling me you do your own intel as well. Uh, you, we've both got the uh, the same way of talking to each other. <laughs> it, you know, same old, same old, sir. We, we just uh, do the diligence, uh, the due diligence in the background to uh, and it always helps out in the long run, right? Yeah. Well, you know, it's been an interesting process. Um, so you're going to be the first person that I've uh, interviewed from the military in an official capacity. But it's quite a process, right, for you to get this approved and find out what we can and can't talk about and all that type of stuff. So it is a process in that I have to, um, A, kind of find out a little bit about um, – what it is that you are, you know, trying to ascertain from the army as far as the programs, what I can and can't discuss, mm-hmm. uh, but then also getting that overhead approval from our advertising and public affairs. There's always, you know, processes in place to make sure that uh, yeah. we're doing the right things, saying the right things, because we want to make sure that we're putting out the best information that we can to sure. your listeners. Sure. Well, so let's talk about you for a minute. Where are you talking to us from today? Where are you located? Uh, So I'm currently in Salt Lake City. Uh, I am in the Army Medical Recruiting Station uh, that covers 212,000 square miles in the western U.S. I cover um, most of Idaho, most of Utah, western third of Wyoming, and then the northern part of Nevada. Uh, So that's our headquarters. We do travel a lot. We do a lot of Zoom presentations, kind of like we're doing today as well, um, in an effort to, you know, find uh, the best qualified uh, medical providers that we can for the U.S. Army and Army Reserve. Okay, very cool. Well, so let's talk about you for a moment, Sergeant Reese. So where are you from? Where'd you grow up? So I tell everybody I'm a backwoods boy from Northeast Missouri, sir. I grew up uh, in a very small town in Northeast Missouri, uh, not too far from the Iowa line. Um, interestingly enough, a uh, small town of, you know, my graduating class was about 20 people. Uh-huh. Um You know, president of my FFA uh, club, my senior year, pretty good deal there. So I I can uh, really get into your listener base with some of this stuff um, as far as, you know, where the interest lies and how you can utilize some of these programs to to get a professional career in the Mm -hmm. agricultural world. I did not realize you'd been in the FFA. That's very cool. Yeah. uh, You know, my school was so small, actually, that we didn't have a chapter until my senior year. Okay. Um, but whenever we had, uh, you know, agricultural construction, I jumped in on that. Um, so a lot of welding, fabrication, that type. Um, jumped into rangeland management and judging, um, meat judging, you know, for a lot of those uh, different cuts, uh, you know, beef, pork and all that type. Um, I also did some horse judging, did a lot of farming, that type of stuff as well. Cool. When did you graduate high school? Uh, whew, I'm going to date myself. 2003, sir. Oh goodness, that's nothing. Ninety-one for me, so you make it. You're making me look ancient. Okay, you got a few years on me, sir. Just a couple. <laughs> okay, very cool. And now, did you grow up farming then? Uh, so I grew up in a farming community. Okay. Um, so my family did not have a farm. We didn't have our own farm. However, a lot of my friends uh, had. They ran bigger farms, so I was always spending my summers 
uh, bucking hay bales or putting up fence uh, during the spring, doing a lot of cultivating. Mm -hmm. Fall was hard at the time. So in between basketball and baseball practice, you're out trying to, uh, yeah. you know, put in some corn or some beans. So um, I spent a lot of my high school time, you know, either uh, with the hammer and stapler, you know, on the, uh, the fence line or behind mm -hmm. the wheel of a case trying to put in some crops. Okay. So then when you graduated, did you go directly into the military? So after I graduated, I went into the uh, National Guard. So I did part time okay. uh, one week in a month, two weeks a year. Same with the, like the Army Reserves, more or less. Um, with the intent of going through school, uh, my goal was to, to go into college. I uh, hadn't really decided on a degree plan yet. Um, but I knew that the military was going to help get me there. Uh, but after I graduated, I was uh, sent overseas pretty quick. Uh, I did a tour in Iraq in 2003. Uh, found out the soldiering was kind of where my talents really lied, and I loved okay. it. So I came back. After a few years, um, I actually did some taxidermy work, too. I worked in a taxidermy shop for, for a little bit. Um, but then I went active duty and have not looked back and I've been doing it for about 15 years now. Very cool. Well, um, you know, I used to get this said to me all the time when I was a police officer and I'm sure you get it said to you all the time as well, but thank you for your service. I, you know, people say that and they get a little red face. It's a little embarrassing cause I'm sure you hear it all the time, but I think people really, really do mean it. So thank you very much. Hey, I appreciate it. And thank you for, you know, what you've done as well. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that too. So, Okay, so very cool. So you have been doing it full time now. Did you say fifteen years? Is my math right on that? It'll be about fifteen years in October, yes, sir. Okay, and your current rank is Sergeant First Class. Correct. Okay, and so me being not uh, never serving in the military, are you what's considered a non commissioned officer? Is that Sergeant First Class? I am. So I would be considered a senior non-commissioned officer on the enlisted side. You have ranks of E1 through E9. Um, so as an E7 sergeant first class, I'm now into the senior enlisted ranks. Okay. Um, not to be confused with the commissioned officers, which and and the warrant officers, totally different ball game there. But okay. All right. Now, how did you choose the army? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, so. Believe it or not, I was an Army brat. Uh, my dad was serving in the U.S. Army. I was born in Fort Hood, Texas, of all places. Um, I looked into every branch when I was in high school. You know, uh, I had considered uh, several of them, uh, minus, you know, no offense against the Navy, but mm -hmm. I don't like boats and I don't <laughs> like water. So okay. that wasn't going to work for me. Uh, but I settled on the Army because at the time, um, you know, I like to have as much say in what I do. So the Army gave me the option to look into the jobs that I qualified for. And I was able to select the profession I wanted before I signed my contract, which okay. meant a lot to me at that time. Okay. And so then how did you find yourself uh, working into a position in, in Army medicine? That's also a very interesting story. I have no idea. It was an assignment that I received. Um, I've been in the recruiting command since about uh, 2013. I started out in northern Wyoming as a recruiter. Um, and then after I went into recruiting full time, um, I ended up in northern Utah and Logan. And then I came down on orders for the Army medicine side, which has been um, a very interesting experience for me because I did not know about 90 percent of these programs that the Army offers. And okay. um, that's why I said earlier, it's best kept secret. The more I serve in this capacity. And the more people I talk to, the more I get to research and dig and just see how many options there are for people to go from point A to point B. Okay. All right. Well, let's let's talk about the veterinary side for a moment. What does an Army veterinarian – well, and let me preface this a little bit too. So you know from doing your intel research on me that I interview a lot of FFA students and we talk a lot about ag education and stuff like that. And one of the things that comes up so often is I have students say, I want to go become a veterinarian. And, and man, they've got the talent, they've got the drive, the passion, they've got the brain power, none of which I ever had myself, by the way. I, I thought I was going to be a vet and it was just, it never, never happened. But, uh, but they've got it. But I know that vet school itself is a, uh, it's a very significant challenge to get accepted into and B, mm -hmm. it can be very expensive to pay for 
And then to come out, especially if you want to be a large animal vet, but even a small animal vet, then it, it's a challenge to get it paid back when you come back, when you come out and you want to start a practice and do all of that. And so I was thinking about that. The more students that I interviewed that wanted to go into uh, become veterinarians and go to veterinary school, how are they going to get this done and how can they do it without saddling themselves uh, you know, with just unbelievable amounts of debt trying to start off their careers. And I knew that there was something uh, through the military in general, it turns out to be the Army, but something through the military in general uh, involving veterinarians. And that's what I want to talk about with you today is, is this pathway and what do, what do uh, military or Army veterinarians do? So if we could start with that, you know, people are probably wondering what in the world, why are there veterinarians in the, in the army? So maybe we could start with that. So, um, the U S army veterinary court does have a very diverse mission set. I mean, obviously with, uh, you know, after 1980 being the only executive agent for department of defense with veterinary services, the army is it whenever it comes to, you know, uh, anything veterinary related. Mm -hmm. So we do take care of, you know, military working dogs. There are still, you know, horse uh, regiments, you know, competition teams within the, the Department of Defense. So we do run clinics as well on mil uh, on any installation. So those Army veterinarians are still doing the large and small animal care. Okay. But we diversified in that we also, our veterinarians do take part in food and safety security across the the uh, Department of Defense and Army installations. Uh, they do public health uh, as far as veterinary concerns are, um, you know, across the uh, um, an installation, the public health part of that. And they also do uh, participate in research and development as well. So our veterinarians are not just concerned with the, the health and welfare. That is a primary mission set, but they do have a very diverse mission set within our command. Hmm. How do they, how do they get involved? Like with food safety, what, what's a veterinarian doing there? So, uh, you know, that goes back to even the 1800s, whenever, uh, food was being sent to a uh, military outpost in the, in the West, uh, veterinary corps officers back then were actually looking and inspecting food for safety, sanitary uh, purposes, reasons like that, uh, making sure that it was fit for consumption to soldiers and then sending it on their way. Um, so that's just a small piece of what they do is, uh, you know, for the army today as well. Interesting. And did I read, and, and I think you may have just mentioned this, but did I read that on different army bases, uh, there will be veterinarians there to provide veterinary services for the pets of, of soldiers who are stationed there? Now, I don't know with 100% certainty if the, the veterinary services are extended to the, uh, you know, personal pets or if it's strictly going to be towards, uh, you know, the military side of the house. Okay. Um, that I know there are veterinary clinics on military installations. Um, I've obviously been there and seen them. Um, so I would venture to say it would be a, you know, I hate assuming in this line of work because as a recruiter, it's always <laughs> you want right. it to be in black and white. Uh, so. I would say that it's a fairly safe assumption that they would be able to work in that capacity as well. Okay. Interesting stuff. Okay. So what are the pathways? If somebody wants to become a veterinarian in the army, how can that occur? So we really have two options, Matt. Um, first and foremost, you know, you, uh, I believe it was the one that you originally uh, engaged me with was the health profession scholarship program uh -huh. through the veterinary corps. So that program is open to students who have been accepted into uh, an AVMA uh, accredited DVM or VMD program uh, okay. nationwide. So that would be the first step. And the HPSB, the scholarship program, provides uh, all tuition, all fees, books, anything that's related to cost of the school the Army covers. We also provide a monthly stipend of over $2,300 a month to students. Um, and then after they complete their, their program, they come into the U.S. Army Veterinary Corps as a captain. They serve their active duty service obligation, which is basically one year for every year that the Army paid for school. Okay. That's the first option, and that's what um, a lot of interest draws into uh, those scholarship programs. They're hidden gems, really. They are super competitive, but they are amazing if you're able to get uh, one of those scholarship programs. Okay. Um, the other option is what we call direct accession. 
I mean, I would be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about that as well, because Mm -hmm. you eat in on it earlier talking about being saddled to loans. So if you were to direct assess, meaning you already meet all the criteria to be a practicing veterinarian, you can come into the active duty army or the army reserve. And we do offer what we call health professions, loan repayment programs. So the army will actually help you pay down on your student loans or pay them off completely, depending on how much you have in return um, for time served. So it's same thing, one for one normally. And that is available active duty or even in the army reserve. Is that right? Okay. So very, very interesting. So I want to come back to the scholarship part. So to clarify the other half of it, you've already become a veterinarian, but you've got $60,000. I'm just a hypothetical number. You've got $60,000 in student loans or who knows, maybe you got 200 grand. I don't know. Um, you've got it sitting there. You can, I guess, apply. I don't know how it works. Apply to join the army and serve as a veterinarian in the army, either active duty or in the reserves and have that loan paid for by the army in exchange for that service. Correct. Yes, sir. Now it will be, um, there's normally a cap, a yearly cap, um, for, you know, and every year it changes. So I could only give you this year's incentive amounts and Mm -hmm. then next year they might change. So for this year, as an army reservist, if you were to say, um, assess for three years of service as the reserve veterinary corps officer, the army would pay up to $60,000 of your student loan. It's basically $20,000 a year per year. Um, And there is normally a max on that. So they may say, Hey, we'll cap it at $80,000 or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. And regular army numbers, uh, if you're going active duty are are fairly similar, they're going to be about 20,000 a year. Now, is that in addition to being paid for your time working as a veterinarian in the army? Absolutely. You will still get uh, your, your, as an active duty officer, you would get base pay. You would get a housing allowance, um, sustenance allowance. Uh, you could get board certification pay for being a board certified vet, uh, doctor of veterinary medicine. Um, Army reserves, you do get battle drill assembly pay. So for every weekend that you um, show up to your unit to do your drills, you'll get paid for that weekend. You'll have access to uh, low cost um you know, healthcare as well as insurance. Mm-hmm. You do get the full benefit package on top of the loan repayment. Okay. Okay. Now, for a veterinarian, for somebody who's looking at this option, when they join, whether it's active duty or as as a reserve, uh, they go in at the rank of captain. Did I hear that correctly? At minimum, captain. At so minimum. if you are a practicing uh, veterinarian that has had several years of experience, and then also depending on any con- uh, any further um, education that you may have received in that mm-hmm. field, we can also look at adjusting your rank. And you could come in at a higher level, maybe as a what we would consider a field grade officer as a major. Okay. Um, but it really is get captain minimum. And then depending on experience, you could get more time or an additional uh, level of rank. Okay. Now I'm sure the the burning question for people who are out there working as veterinarians, they've got their, they've got their nice life. Like I've got sitting here in my studio is when you do that, do you have to go through basic training and do all of that? So as an officer, you will go through two different training programs. One's called direct commissioning course and the other is called basic officer leadership course. So, um, Direct commission course is basically an officer's introduction to the U.S. Army, kind of what an enlisted soldier would be going through as far as initial entry training or what we all call basic. Okay. That's kind of like where officers learn how to A, B officers, B, you know, who to salute, who salutes you, how to properly wear a uniform, so on and so forth. Um, And then you get into basic officer leadership course where you get into a little more nuanced um, lessons in specifically what a veterinary corps officer will do in the army or army reserve. It's going to break that down a little bit more. And you'll also learn things, you know, like your um, uniform code of military justice, because you do have authority as an officer in the UCMJ. So you learn a litany, uh, you know, a little bit more in depth about what it means to be an officer. Okay. And uh, the physical component, the, the exercise, the running, the shooting, the defensive tactics, all of that, is that included? So I'm going to tell you, first and foremost, regardless of what you do, you're a soldier, first and foremost, okay. and a leader as well. So they are still going to be expected to meet uh, physical fitness requirements. Uh, they will have to be able to qualify on their individually assigned weapon. 
Um, they will do everything else a soldier does. Uh, the Army, if we needed veterinarians, we could go find them. Uh, you know, we could go out and, you know, contract out a veterinarian. But yeah. the Army wants leaders. The Army wants officers who specialize as veterinarians. So not only are they able to do a very special skill force, but they can also be leaders within our formation. Okay. Okay, very good. So I, I'm assuming that that's a question that people would have, and I, I I assume that was the answer as well. Here I am assuming on everything, but you've just warned me about that. I can't I can't assume with the recruiter. So you can assume. I just don't <laughs> think I should assume. There's, okay. a, there's a delineation there. Okay, very good. Okay, so that that's great to know. So if – okay, and then one other question on that pathway. Is that pathway to come in that way, is that as competitive as the scholarship pathway? So I would say it is competitive, but there are more opportunities and positions available for what we would call direct accession officer uh, than the scholarship. So for the scholarships, we average about 33 a year nationwide. Okay. That's what we offer. Um, it's, I would say the vet corps is one of the top two competitive scholarships that we offer. Um, but as far as like the direct accessions piece, there are going to be more slots uh, available for officers, especially within the reserves. Um, and I would say there's definitely a handful every year for the regular army as well. Okay. So to clarify 33 di direct accession scholarships per year. 33 health profession scholarships. Oh, that would 33. be somebody going into vet school. Okay. Um, for the direct accessions, uh, that's going to be kind of dictated yearly based on needs of the Army and Army Reserves. Okay. Forgive me while I understand all the terminology. So th 33 scholarships per year for going to vet school. So that's that's yep. highly that's highly competitive. I mean, that's that's not a ton. Um, so At all. so then let me ask you for a student who's listening to this. Uh, maybe they're they're graduating high school. Maybe they're in college now, and they've got their eyes set on vet school, and they would like to uh, find a way to get this student loan taken care of, or, or to get this paid forth and and go and and serve in the U.S. Army as a veterinarian. Would a good plan of action be to apply for that scholarship uh, for one of those thirty three scholarships, and then if they don't achieve that scholarship, if they don't, if they're not awarded that, to go ahead and I suppose, go through the conventional route to become a veterinarian, go to vet school, become a vet, even if you get the, you know, you have to take out the student loans, but then come back and then try and go in the, and I believe it's direct accession. Am I saying that correctly? Absolutely, sir. Okay. So is that a, is that a reasonable plan of action? That is a hundred percent reasonable plan of action. I tell everybody that the, uh, Always apply for the scholarship. If, if you have an interest in doing it, if you are willing to serve your country, willing to be a leader, and you want to see if the if you can get one of those scholarships, apply. Because I've had people call me up and they're like, oh, that doesn't sound like something that I would achieve. You know, or they say, well, it's too competitive for me. I don't think I can make it. Well, you won't ever know unless you attempt it. Mm -hmm. um, and we, you know, my, here in my office, we do a very good job of sitting down and having realistic conversations. You know, we are career counselors and advocates for our applicants. We want to give them every opportunity to be successful in the profession that they're choosing. So we know how to, you know, build packets correctly, how to make sure that, you know, the, the letters are saying the right things. You know, we give them guidance on how they should, uh, what right looks like more or less. But like you said, if they do not get selected for the scholarship, go through the conventional route and then come back and talk to me about the reserves of the active duty option. We'll still be able to pay down your student loans. You're still going to come in as an officer. You'll still be able to serve. Okay. Um, and it's just another way to have your cake and eat it too. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Okay. So uh, you, you went over this earlier, but I want to make sure and clarify this. Explain the time commitment again, uh, the commitment to serving uh, that... <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. So for the scholarship, for the health profession scholarship program, you're looking at a year for year. So for every year the Army pays for veterinary school, you're going to owe one year of active duty service time okay. for a minimum of three year. It's a minimum three year commitment. OK. Um, and then for anything else for the loan repayment options, it's generally also year for year. So for every year you take the loan repayment option, you're going to owe a year of time for that um, 
incentive more or less. Okay. That's the best way to look at it. Rule of thumb. It's just a year for year. If uncle Sam will pay for a year, you're going to owe one. Gotcha. Okay. And how does, how do, how do you determine what paying for a year is? Is it based on a dollar amount or what the tuition was for that, that one year of vet school? It's going to be based on whatever the incentive option is at the time. So if, for example, we're offering $20,000 a year of loan repayment, then you're going to say, hey, I have, you know, $80,000 of student loans. Uh, can I do a four year contract? Um, and then we'll be able to crunch the numbers and, and then do those contracts up mm -hmm. to meet the requirement based on um, what your student loan is and then what the incentive is. Okay. All right. Well, I want to backtrack a little bit because I, I feel like I'm getting into all the nuts and bolts of how you can get vet school paid for and how you can become a veterinarian. <laughs> but I don't want to make it sound like this is some sort of a trick or something. You should not do this unless you have got a desire to serve your country and to be a soldier first. Correct. hundred percent. So uh, I did kind of say earlier that, and this is something I tell everybody that sits across my desk uh, that I had this conversation with, and it doesn't matter if they're a veterinary course student, a medical school student, if they are, you know, already a practicing physician. I'm like the army wants leaders. We want commitment. We want soldiers first mm -hmm. and foremost, and then we will give you the option to pursue your profession and your passion in that capacity. So I tell everybody, if you're not willing to be an officer and leader first in the profession that you choose, then this may not be a good option for you because mm -hmm. the Army wants leaders. That's what we're looking for first and foremost is leaders within our formation. Okay. Yeah, and I think that's important to stress, and I don't want to make it sound like this is some, you know, backdoor trick or something like that. Uh, you know, you don't want to join the U.S. Army if you don't have a full commitment to serving your country as in the best possible capacity that uh, that you're capable of. Yes, sir. And so the way I normally put it, I say the Army's not looking for veterinary officers. They're looking for officers who happen to be veterinarians. Sure. So you, there, there's always the emphasis on on the being a soldier first. And that is always one of the first things that we do stress to anybody looking into our options is, hey, you are a soldier. You are an officer first and foremost. Okay. Well, now here you are. Uh, you didn't start out intending to make a career out of the military, but then you got into it and realized how much you enjoyed it. And now you're making a career out of it. So talk to folks who are considering this. Why do you enjoy, why is this career path for you so enjoyable? Why do you like it so much? So for, you know, I, I always go back to uh, my, what I would consider humble origins in uh, Northeast Missouri. Uh, my entire family still lives pretty much in the state. Um, a few of us have ventured out <laughs> beyond the Missouri borders, uh -huh. uh, but I've had opportunities to travel. I've been overseas, you know, obviously the, the awesome places like Iraq and Afghanistan, <laughs> you know, but I've also been to, you know, Kuwait, Kazakhstan, all over Europe, I was stationed in Germany for three years, you know, um, I got to bring my wife to Paris, France and spend a week in downtown Paris. I mean, that's not too bad for a backwoods Missouri boy, you know, <laughs> to be able to do something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Um, but the army has given me the opportunity to not only travel, um, I'm still pursuing my education. I'll be completing my bachelor's degree probably uh, spring of 21. And I've already got my eye on a master's program Great. immediately after, um, and natural resources actually is the direction I'm leaning towards. Um, but it's also given me skill sets, you know, as far as things that as a student, I was not aware of. So, Everybody gets it in their head about college degrees, certifications, that type of stuff. But mm -hmm. what they don't think about are soft skills that are just as important in the workplace. Things like the ability to work as an integral team player, problem solving, communication skills, leadership, all very valuable attributes that you can't get anywhere else except with real world experience. So the mm -hmm. Army's given me the option to pursue that that degree program, but they're also giving me the opportunity to develop myself in the soft skills and, and then be a leader within an organization, which is, is paramount, I think, to be successful. That's great. Yeah, well put. Okay. That is awesome. What uh, what were your assignments uh, when you were in Iraq and Afghanistan? Uh, so my first tour back way back when in 2003, I was a, as a combat engineer. Uh, so we did a lot of route reconnaissance, bridge reconnaissance, um, we did a lot of uh, 
what we call unexploded ordnance reduction. So unexploded bombs and munitions, we would reduce. Um, we did a lot of uh, minefield surveys and markings as well in southern Iraq. Tons of fun there. Um, my second tour in Iraq and then my subsequent tour in Afghanistan as an infantryman, I served as a uh, uh, squad leader, an infantry squad leader, a fire team leader, section sergeant. Uh, basically just leadership positions on, on the infantry side after I went into the active duty part. Wow. That's interesting stuff. I can't tell if you're being, uh, if you're being facetious or serious when you say like Southern Iraq, lots of fun there. So it was actually, it was a little bit of both. Um, <laughs> you know, not very many people could say that they've had to go mark minefields out, uh, uh -huh. like we did. And it was kind of an interesting experience whenever it happened. Um, the several times it happened. Uh, but it's, you know, real world application of the lessons that you learned in basic combat training. You remember those skills that your drill sergeants told you mm -hmm. were so important. And you're like, yeah, I'm never going to use that. And then you find yourself actually using it. Mm. And you remember those lessons very quickly. Very cool. Okay. Now, when you were in when a, a combat a combat zone, that, that type of area, did you ever encounter or see any veterinarians working in that in that type of an area? So, no, not that I can recall off the top of my head. Now, we did have, I actually, I take that back. We did have um, what we called, uh, oh, I don't even remember the name of the teams. There were civil support teams in Afghanistan mm -hmm. uh, that would come out and they would do things like um, clinics. They would do vet clinics. They would do public health clinics to where they would do immunizations for children and free clinic checkups. Uh, we had engineers come out, civil engineers that would come and look into uh, in infrastructure for, you know, small villages, uh, predominantly looking at irrigation uh, for a lot of the uh, agricultural regions that we operated in in southern Afghanistan. So I did see them like maybe once or twice, but it wasn't really for a long period of time. And I didn't get a lot of direct interaction because I was the guy pulling the security for everybody yeah. else that was doing that work. Okay. But I, I, the reason I asked that question is I want, I want people to have a realistic vision of where they might go, what they might do uh, if they join the army to become a veterinarian. And so in those regions, there were veterinarians working there deployed into those regions. Absolutely. So I do tell everybody once again, that sits across my you know desk from me. Mm -hmm. If you decide to work in the capacity of a soldier, it's not a matter of if, but when you will be deployed. Now, some soldiers, you know, go their entire careers without an overseas assignment. Um, some soldiers like me are deployed every other year for the first couple of years of your assignment. It really kind of de is determined by your unit and then kind of also determined by that individual as well. Um, you know, what type of uh, experience they want within the army or army reserve. Mm -hmm. uh, but you could be, you know, working stateside, you could be working in a com active combat zone, um, or you could be doing a lot of humanitarian missions. Uh, you know, army medicine and the veterinary corps do a lot of, uh, humanitarian missions in Africa, uh, Central America, a lot of places around the world where those skill sets are utilized to help, um, you know, local populations. Okay. Well, Sergeant Reese, what have I not asked you that I should have asked you about uh, this pathway? You see, I would say the only thing that you've not asked me about is requirements oh. and then how they can contact me. Those are basically the two things that, I, okay. <laughs> that we'll cover. Uh, requirements for the, the scholarship, uh, you have to be a U.S. citizen. Uh, you have to be able to obtain a security clearance uh, and pass the Army commissioning physical. Um, then you will obviously have to complete your undergrad program and then be accepted into an AVMA accredited program um, to get that scholarship. Now, if we are talking about the direct accession piece, uh, you have to be licensed. Um, you have to have obtained your license to practice through an AVMA accredited program and, and then meet your security clearance and commissioning physical requirements as okay. well. Um, but if there's, you know, there's a lot of, a lot that goes into that. Um, so it's always better for them to, you know, and contact us directly and we can talk with them a little bit more about those requirements. Okay. Very good. And for further information, people want to find out more, where should they go? Uh, so you can check us out on Facebook at uh, Salt Lake City U.S. Army Medical Recruiting. So just go into Facebook, Salt Lake City Army Medical Recruiting. We have a Facebook page, like us, and then they can uh, direct message us there. Uh, they can follow us on Instagram at SLC underscore Army underscore AMED, A-M-E-D-D. 
Um, you can uh, DM us there as well. Um, or we do answer our phones. So you can <laughs> call us at uh, 801-355-0494. Um, if you're more inclined towards a telephonic conversation. Very cool. Well, I really, really appreciate it. Thank you again for your service and thank you for uh, what you're doing to, to bring great leaders into the U.S. Army. I really do appreciate it. Hey, I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to speak with your, your listeners, sir. Um, and thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Well, thank you for being here, everybody. Special thanks to Sergeant Reese for coming on and sharing all that great information with us. And as always, enjoy your journey to the ultimate lifestyle business, agriculture.